This episode is brought to you by Maya Angelou and her incredible quote, People will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Welcome to the Stefan Dyer Podcast, my people. Hi people, ¿cómo están, damas y caballeros? Welcome to the Stefan Dyer podcast where I welcome people with remarkable stories for amazingly vulnerable conversations. I am Stefan Dyer, former banker turned comedian and lifestyle entrepreneur, and today I have my good friend and someone who I deeply admire, the great Jose Piranian. He's in front of me. We're doing the intro, I get to talk about him, and he has to wait until we start this. Look at his beautiful face. Josep Piranha, ladies and gentlemen, is a lifelong stutterer, turned Forbes featured global TEDx speaker on inclusion and resilience. Born and raised in Lebanon, Jose avoided speaking for more than 25 years out of the fear of being judged for being different. Then, everything changed. He won Inspirational Speaker of the Year, delivered four TEDx talks, and performed stand-up comedy in three continents and three languages. Jose has delivered hundreds of stand-up comedy and speaking engagements inclu about inclusion and resilience at Tesla, Google, Dell, and TikTok, and more. With more than 3 million views on Goldcast, Jose has also been featured on ABZ and Forbes. He's one of the people that I... I I admire the most, and you'll get to see today, but really, I've met him, I met him about four years ago, always kind, always deliberately getting out of his comfort zone to become a better person, a better speaker, a better professional, speaks like 45 languages, <laughs> <laughs> and this is one of the guys that I just deeply respect, admire, and always look forward to to his feedback on, on, on the things that I'm doing so that I can continue to grow uh, as a person and as a professional as well. Welcome, my good friend Jose. How are you, man? Uh, appreciate you having me. And I realized when you said I, I performed stand-up in, th in three languages, It has become f four now. Wow. I've been performing in Arabic eh, eh, in Lebanon. Oh, amazing. You know what? I just, re I just forgot that, that I always say the unbreakable, the unmistakable, the highly capable <laughs> Josep Piran. <laughs> okay. I had to say it. I had to say because every single intro yeah. has those words. <laughs> The best part about this episode, obviously, apart from having Jose here, is that you don't know, but we postponed this episode <laughs> like nine times because of the pandemic, because Jose was traveling for speaking engagements. I was uh, like, I was traveling where I had to do other stuff here, and we finally managed to do it. Dude, this is like historic. <laughs> Okay. And it's on on a Monday morning too, yeah. which I think we both deserve some recognition for Big for time. Make, making it happen. <laughs> Big time! I'm not even joking when I say that Jose speaks six languages or more. As you know, he grew up in Lebanon, and. What was it like? I've never been to Lebanon. My grandma, fun fact, used to travel a lot back in the day. And my connection with Lebanon mm. is that she brought to me a, a fossil that she got in Lebanon. Like a, like a, like a fossil that was framed mm. that I could put on the wall of Lebanon. So me growing up in Costa Rica... That was my connection to Lebanon this whole time. And I think you're the one of the, like, my only friend that I know from Lebanon. What was it like growing up there? And did you speak French 
or Spanish or or Arabic because you speak so many languages. What, mm. what was it like, and how did you get immersed into different languages? I love that you somehow waited four years be- before <laughs> sh- sharing this weird fossil story with me. Yeah. I feel like this is if 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 my grandmother had <laughs> brought me a fossil from Costa Rica or Salvador or Peru <laughs> I think I would have shared that the first time uh, I meet you yeah. so I have to say respect for having saved this <laughs> this gem for the right for the right moment yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I always am sad because I lost it but mm. I, I I always think of it I'm like man that would be really cool to, to give my son because she, she, she it was at a place where people could buy fossils mm. and take them and, and it was like it had like a certificate and it had like a little animal in it from millions of years ago I guess Whoa! And uh, okay. and that and that's it. I don't have it anymore. So that's the end of my fossil story. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, w- when you said it was from animals from millions of years ago, I thought you were referring to the to the politicians in Lebanon. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, I I want to answer your question. So I grew up speaking French because Lebanon is a former French colony. I spoke Arabic and my background is Armenian. So I I speak I speak speak that as well i learned english i'm guessing it's the same for for people in latin america through exposure to american tv shows yeah. and and then eventually i i learned it formally in in school i also have relatives who who are from north america so i always had the opportunity to stutter in english with them as well (laughs) and then i took the reason why i i learned spanish and i'm sure your audience will enjoy this story because of my name, and I guess to s- some extent my appearance, people kept on assuming I am Latin or I am s- s- Spanish. Yeah. So they would s- speak to me in <laughs> Spanish right away whenever I would be t- traveling. And this inevitably sparked an interest and curiosity in the language. Yeah. So I'm sure if my name was not Jose, I doubt that I... <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. I don't think I, I would have... Exp- experienced the c- circumstances that led to me developing an interest in the language and the c- and the culture. Yeah. So that's Spanish. And then lastly, I I learned s- some Portuguese, of course, French and s. Spanish helps with Portuguese, so I 
I wouldn't say I'm as fluent, but uh, I could have a k- k- conversation. Did you? Did you? Per- I know you went to um, university in Quebec, mm-hmm. which is another thing that we have in common. True. You went to McGill. Yeah. And I went to a boarding school two hours from Montreal. Yeah. In small town Lennoxville, Quebec, called Bishop's College School. Wow. At the time, <laughs> I wanted to go to McGill 2006, but for those of you listening, you may not know, there's a little thing in Quebec called Cégep, which mm, is yeah. a semi-university <laughs> in between high school and university. So it's like a college called Cégep, and you have to do one or two years mm. if you are from Quebec or living in Quebec before you go into university. And at that time, you couldn't graduate from an international school in Quebec, 12th grade, and go into university because you had to go through Seja. Now, Quebecois students, they finish grade 11. That's when they graduate. And then they go into Seja for one or two years. Mm. And then they go into university. But now, if you're in an international school like mine, you can go straight into Miguel. Oh, yeah? I might have mm. gone. I might have. You never know. We might have shared... Some some experiences there. And you also lived for a, a small bit in Mexico, right? Yeah. So I I lived in Mexico City in in el, in el DF for between four and f- five months. Nice. Like yeah. in what year? Like were you in high school or were you in university? No, so I was doing my I was doing my masters wow. at at K- Queen's University in Kingston and wow. I so this was in 2013. I went to to Mexico. I it's not what I expected it to be. Uh, I think it is I had a. I didn't know what to expect, and when I got there, it it felt like Mexico City was like a Latin Manhattan. Really? Yeah. Every neighborhood having its own vibe. Whether we are t- talking about a. Uh, about about Polanco being more, let's say, corporate A or posh, and yeah. and, then, and then like Condesa, more Bohemian, Roma as well. It's that Santa Fe is like su- su- is like super corporate, and yes. it was really an uh, awesome time. Yeah, you have some fun. Fond memories. So tell me about this transition from, based on your bio, Mm -hmm. from avoiding speaking for more than 25 years out of the fear of being judged for being different Mm. to now being like a very recognized speaker, Mm. motivational speaker as well. Mm. And how did this evolve? Because in university, in high school, we have to give presentations. Mm. And the worst part is sometimes there is a – well, maybe worse or not worse, but unfortunately or or fortunately, there is a component sometimes of participation. Mm. Or sometimes like the final grade is a presentation where you have to speak in public. Mm. How did how did that go for you in, in high school and university? Yeah. A- and uh, – when did you make the big jump? Because mm. it's not like you wake up one day and you're like, oh, now I'm comfortable. Mm. How did that happen? Mm. So w- when I was in my s- second year at McGill, I, I, I begged every professor to exempt me from all of my presentations i and it was i i was in business school where <laughs> it is almost all about these p- p- 
presentations and I still recall these conversations I would have with each of these professors to tell them and what's almost ironic before I continue that thought is I had already learned my breathing technique that helped me control my stutter at the time in spite of having learned some pretty effective te techniques I was I w I, w I was not willing to to openly reveal my secret the secret that I was weird that I was different and s silence seemed like the optimal course of action as far as me remaining pro protected yeah. goes so i i begged these professors and in some cases i even offered to do additional assignments so so that the professors could grade me on those yeah. instead of ever having to to speak in 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 their classes so that's the state of 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 me being controlled by fear that i i lived in wow in terms of the transition that you refer to the first step and i know that you are very familiar with that step the first step was i joined toastmasters in my third year i believe in, at mcgill oh wow i knew that to confront what seemed like a radical obstacle I needed a solution that was proportionately radical. I could not just ch ch challenge myself by calling my grandmother once a month to p practice or oh, or oh. Although you sh you sh should be calling your <laughs> grandparents <laughs> if you can, I I had to do something uh, as radical, and th th that's why to confront extreme avoidance out of fear, mm -hmm. the idea of public speaking as a challenge made sense so i i went to toastmasters as a first step that's crazy and what were the first sessions like and how did you feel how did you discover hey there's something here you know mm. that there's something i'm clearly i'm 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 not your typical speaker, but mm. not. I, mean, I don't mean that. I mean, hey, there's a, there's a future for me here in terms of maybe motivating other people, not just myself, mm. and and inspiring others. To to me, my my eureka moment at mm. Toastmasters, mm -hmm. which I joined in 2012, and that's where I really discovered that I was funny, mm. and that's where oh. I really discovered that I could I, I could do something else because. My eureka moment was every time I had to do a speech, even if it was serious, mm. 
people would laugh. And I'm like, <laughs> this is not supposed to be funny. <laughs> and then people would say, oh, you're funny, you're funny. And then I'm like, okay, I'm just going to do funny speeches anyways. Mm. And then that was around the time that I was doing Vines and, and Instagram videos. Okay. And some of my vi videos back in the day went viral. Mm. So I'm like, okay, there's, there's things that I am passionate about. Mm. These sketch comedy videos online mm. and uh, clearly people think that i'm funny because all the speeches uh, that i do they're laughing and then we got the first invite from diego that you know to do stand-up comedy at this spanish open mic wow there's no spanish there, i mean the, the open mic was not about comedy it was about singing poetry mm. guitar anything that you wanted to do mm. And Diego invited Juan and myself in September of 2014. Whoa. So that that was like the before and after for me. But for two years, I was doing speeches at Toastmasters. Wow. And you got to listen to what people say, you know. Sometimes you're so stuck, you're so close to the wall that you don't, you can't hear the feedback, the positive feedback, you know. Mm. When, when did you know that, hey, this is something that I could do not just at my Toastmasters club, but, but maybe other places. Mm. So what's so interesting about the way you phrase the question, and, uh, uh, and by the way, for the audience, if you have a fear of p public speaking, I do highly recommend joining to Toastmasters. It, it, it can be to transformational. Yeah. So, and we both now do it for a living. Just, just for context <laughs> for our, our 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 listeners, Toastmasters, especially if you're in Latin America and you have no, this is the first time you hear the word. It's a it's an organization, non for profit around the world, where typically you meet once a week mm -hmm. for an hour to practice your public speaking. Typically, there is a Toastmaster, which is the Master of Ceremonies, which takes the meeting from A to Z, from start to finish. Then there's three speeches that three other people evaluate. So one person evaluates Speaker 1, another person evaluates Speaker 2, and another person evaluates Speaker 3. Then there is a small section called Table Topics, which is where you speak off the cuff with no preparation. So I would say, Jose, if you could invite three people f over at your house for dinner, dead or alive, who would they be and why? And now you have to speak for a minute with no preparation, which is really good for this type of elevator speeches, elevator pitches. And then at the end of the year, every club, there are thousands of clubs around the world. They have humorous speech contest, evaluation contest, table topics contest, and in international speech contest, which is like a, typically like a motivational type of, mm. of speech. Mm. So that's Toastmasters and we both joined it and, and, and millions of people have joined it mm. because it's all around the world. So mm. continue. Yeah, so to answer your, your question, in interestingly, my first speeches at Toastmasters were uh, about random topics. I would speak about about traveling, about languages. I even had done a, a speech about Medellin and the, <laughs> and the tr transformation that that city had yeah. had in the, in the p p past years. You should have Medellin on, on your podcast. Yeah, it would be <laughs> as, incredible. As a, as a as, uh, remarkable story. Yeah, <laughs> remarkable <laughs> story of change and of t transformation. Yeah. So, what's uh, interesting is that so uh, I had joined Toastmasters, and I only saw it as a way to. Ch challenge myself yeah and i i had been a member i stopped for a while i was in mexico for a while and then i i moved back to lebanon for a year 
I did join a club there. And when I moved to to Toronto, I I joined a club here locally. And I I would do these speeches about random topics, but still only perceiving public speaking as a way to work on myself and as a way to do something that I am terrified of doing. Mm -hmm. When I reached the last speech of that first program in Toastmasters, the, the, the last speech was about, if you recall, inspiring your audience. Yeah. And I recall actually thinking, hmm, what could my speech be about? <laughs> it, it, was not, it was not obvious to me. I, I was like, hmm... What could I possibly s s s speak about to inspire the audience? And then s someone in the club was like, "Well, you should talk <laughs> about the fact that you are challenging yourself with public speaking as someone who s." starters and that's when i i had prepared that speech i think it was in 26 no uh i think it was in late 2016 or or even possibly early 2017 yeah yeah so it it was not obvious at first. That was what like your breakout year because, well, shout out to Carol Zoccoli. I don't know if you're listening to this, but Carol, great Brazilian comedian who lived Boy, in... Boy, Carol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she had this incredible stand-up comedy show here called... ESL comedy, um, CSL. comedy CSL comedy as a second language yeah, yeah. and she messaged me on Facebook and she's like hey I have this friend his name is Jose and and he speaks Spanish uh, can I send him to your can I connect can you guys connect and I'm like yeah, yeah of course and we talked you came to the open mic in Kensington wow. when this was like at El Arepaso, El Arepaso. 2017. Wow, well, yeah. And you came, <laughs> you destroyed that set. I remember everybody was laughing. And then it was like we had a lot of things in common. We kept connecting. And then I was I was seeing your Facebook that year. We were friends already, everything. And you had just become the inspirational speaker of the year mm -hmm. of Speaker Slam, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is um, an organization that hosts inspirational speak speeches mm -hmm. once a month. They have a, a competition, and then the winners of each month go on to the to the big grand slam of that year to compete. And Jose took the whole pie, the whole thing, won that year, and. It was like a, in many ways, a big trampoline for you to not just believe it because you already, I mean, maybe a lot of people saw that you were great, but this was like kind of validating for you to like, fuck, man, this is like, I won the whole thing. And, yeah. and um, what, what did that mean to you? And was that an immediate trampoline for you to now travel the world giving inspirational speeches mm. on, on inclusion and, and, and diversity? Was that a pivotal moment for you? It was. So, big shout out to, to Rina, Rina and, Dan. and Dan. So, before delivering that talk at S S S at S P 
speaker slam, I was not aware that there is a message that can potentially impact others p- 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 positively. When I shared that story on that stage, and a lot of people reached out after, k- came up to me, I think that's when I realized that, hey, on the one hand, the public speaking challenge allows you to gain more confidence around speaking both on stage and off stage at the same time however this experience is not happening in a vacuum or on an uh, island you you might say things that will resonate with other people who are going through their own adversity, whatever that is. Yeah. It was a a key. It was a key key moment for me, and I also would be to telling this story at different events like at different story t- telling shows in yeah. in Toronto like more Mondays and a bunch of these these events and when I delivered however like that deck talk I believe this also symbolized the transition into into professional speaking. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible, man. And one of the other things that that joins us, I feel, is that we're some of the only keynote speakers that have a ser- a serious comedy business. You know, mm. not a lot of people have that. I feel, which makes us distinct Mm. and unique and in many ways the keynote speech is a little refreshing too you know because Mm. you can have you can have suspense you can have motivation and then you can break the ice and the tension with a little bit of humor so people end up having an it's not a speech it's an experience you know exactly and i think i became a i mean the same way that you refer to yourself as as banker to comedian, I perceived my j- journey at its core to be to be one of from stutterer to comedian because the comedy played an enormous role in my journey uh when i s- started to jo- to joke about being different it allowed me to change my relationship with what it means to be me and it transformed an insecurity into a source of connection with the audience with other human beings and it replaced the isolation that i had felt due to being different with with k- 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 connection yeah man and it, it kind of releases the tension we always have a quote in our public speaking through comedy courses where we say that pointing out the elephant in the room mm. diffuses the negative. It, mm. it, it breaks the, it, it releases the tension mm. and it, it won't change the fact, but it'll make me more comfortable with what it is. Like, f- mm. like for example, when I was starting to like balding, mm. I like, I would 
I would be so uncomfortable. Mm. But then I started doing some bits about it, and then I'm like, after a while, I'm like, yeah, it's not as big as, as an issue as it as it was before. I mean, I'm still balding. I'm more bald now than five years ago, but it, yeah. it stopped being. It, it says it's as if like I saw it a bigger deal than it actually was to other people. Yeah, and you know, I'm I'm happy. I only have a s- <laughs> stutter to deal with. I wouldn't be able to deal with balding. <laughs> Phew. Yeah, you, you can't relate to that one. No. <laughs> I think one of your best lines, man, ever. And it's it's uh on your Instagram profile, I think, mm. as well. Mm-hmm. It's correct me if I'm wrong, but it's everyone stutters. I just do it when I speak. Mm. And that is like a billion dude. If somebody gave you this quote, you gotta give him like four billion dollars. <laughs> Did you come up with it? Did you hear it somewhere? Because it really encompasses everything that is in your TED talks, in your speeches, and that universal message is so key to the connection. Cause maybe a lot of people don't stutter. Maybe a lot of people don't do this or that. But when you say that statement, it connects you. To the other person that maybe doesn't stutter, but they have a different stutter. Yeah. But they don't have a stutter, but they have a stutter. You know what I mean? Mm. How did you come up with it, and, and what do you mean by that? Yeah. So when I first s- started to, to deliver these talks, especially at storytelling events and and at at events in general i would have some conversations with p- people about these about these talks and these topics and the first thing i had realized was that everyone had i mean every person had their equivalent Mm -hmm. of what I was going through. So someone would reach out to me after my, after the Goldcast feature. A lot of people reached out. I recall one of them. He told me he he had been dealing with with substance addiction. Yeah. And he told me that something about about my speech made him want to face this fear and become a better father and husband. Wow. And I still remember when I received that message, I literally had to sit down and process what I had just read. And it also made me realize that everyone goes through uh, one or more obstacles in their lives. Yeah. And they can relate with my journey and the message and the insights I share without necessarily having gone through the same identical experience. Yeah, man. So there was this universality 
to the concept of having a s s stutter that translated and that could impact others. In terms of the specific wording, I'm sure it was the the combination of a few conversations. I've had two people come to mind right now. Jamal Lindo, who's an emotional intelligence expert, as well as Evan Sekera, who had shared the stage with me at at my first TEDx. So I feel like it was maybe a, a combination of of all of those experiences. That's brilliant. I'm really curious because you've opened, you've done speeches in front of thousands of people. I remember you opened for Nemer. Is that how you pronounce it? Nemer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Who's a huge comedian in 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 the um, in, is it in Lebanon or in the yeah. Middle East? Yeah, so he's based in the U.S., but he 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 is he is super well known in Lebanon, the Middle East, and of course the Arab communities all around the world. Yeah, he's huge, and I think you opened in front of like three thousand people. You. You've been to Dubai, you've been to like so many places in the States, in Canada. When I talk to fellow comedians and speakers, I always like to know if they have a specific ritual mm. or things that they do before to deal with the anxiety or deal with the fear of not getting any laughs or <laughs> just like getting in the right mindset. I meditate. And that's my one thing that I love to do mm. because it, I'm like, okay, I'm ready. It's mm. like the cherry on top, you know? Mm. I mean, obviously I have to prepare. It's not like if I don't prepare and I meditate, I'm going <laughs> to do a killer show. I prepare, <laughs> I meditate, and then I'm ready to go. Is there anything that you do before your speeches or your comedy sets mm. that makes you feel like, okay, let's go. This is going to be incredible or at least like I'm ready. Yeah, so... I I also meditate. Sometimes I'll be in the green room yeah. or the backstage or the b backstage. I'll I'll put my AirPods on yeah. and I'll do I'll do a meditation using an app like Calm or or Re or recordings I've used in the past. I will also sometimes re remind myself of the c cosmic absurdity and insignificance of the moment. So I remember this one time I was here at at. Absolute comedy, yeah, in uh, Toronto, very good comedy club, and uh, I was in the in the green room. At some point, I pop out to see what's happening, and I I I look at the audience. I then look at the stage. I look at the audience, <laughs> I look at the stage, and I think, I'm about to go up there. And mind you, I had already done stand-up many, many times. And in th that moment, it helped to be like, Jose, you are, you are made of star stuff. And you are on on some random rock in the galaxy 
in the universe. And while what you are feeling is personally meaningful and relevant in the grand scheme of things, <laughs> it is yeah. insignificant. And sometimes this perspective g- gives me a s- it gives me a s- smiling attitude and it empowers me to to coexist with the fear that's so good sometimes i'm like <laughs> i think uh, we've talked this with huang several times sometimes i tell it to my students i try not to because it kind of minimizes their whole work throughout the course mm. but a couple of times if i see somebody really nervous i'm like dude you know that Nobody cares. <laughs> Nobody cares. Nobody will remember this. If if you bomb, it's okay. If you do great, it's okay. One bad show doesn't mean you you suck at stand up comedy. One good show doesn't mean you're good at stand up comedy. <laughs> it's the consistency throughout it. Also, those five minutes that you're gonna be up there are gonna feel like. 29 seconds in in a, in a, in, a, in 5 minutes. So just enjoy it. Try to enjoy it. Try to savor the moment because otherwise you're just going to suffer throughout it, you know? And the butterflies kind of make it worth it. Otherwise it would be just just be a non-issue, but I I've said this at Toastmasters many times, but I I've been there for almost 10 years and basically for the last nine and a half years or more, I've never written a speech. And the, unless it was like a competition that I really had to narrow down the time and everything. But the reason why I never did it is because I didn't want it to stress me out so much mm. to the point that it it became suffering mm. and stress. So I always think long term. I'm like I always map these things long term. This is how my mind works. My mind is just like patterns and and, and long term and mm. so I'm like okay, if I suffer through this in the next 10 years I'm going to do uh let's see 75 speeches maybe. Mm. 7 speeches a year or less. But if I don't suffer through it and I just put myself on this spots of improvement and improvement Maybe I'll do 300 speeches mm. because it's not – I don't have to put so much effort into all of them. I'm, 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 I'm looking for iterations, mm. not like perfection, you know? Mm. Like done is better than perfect. So mm. I did so many speeches and did so many things that I became, as a result, a better speaker than trying to do everything perfect and it becoming really, really stressful. Yeah, yeah. I, I had read this so- – I had read about this study in a book. Don't don't remember which the photography class where the the teacher had two groups. In one group, he he told the students that they have to capture one amazing shot and that the entire mark the entire grade would depend on that one photo however the other group they had to take a lot of photos throughout the term and the teacher found that the quantity group also ended up being the quality group. Yeah. Because of how often they 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 had to create. In in many ways, stand-up comedy is like that, Mm. you know? 
how many, like probably only 10% of the things that we've ever written have stood the test of time, mm. you know? 90% that never makes it. But you gotta, you have to go through the 90% to be able to find the diamonds mm. that'll make it to your own comedy special or whatever, or, or jokes that always stick, you know? And it sucks because it's not fun to be in front of an audience and you're like, ah! And they don't laugh, you know, it fucking sucks. But it, it, you <laughs> have to go through it, and only the brave can do it. I mean, you know, a lot of people see Kevin Hart, and they're like, yeah, no, that's so good. I'm, I want to be famous and rich and kill it. But Kevin Hart says it. He sucked for like 10 years, you know, mm. <laughs> or more before he made it. And yeah. It's iterations. So my latest t- t- TEDx talk that I delivered on... So Saturday at the Dex McMaster in that talk the idea I am presenting is that your breakthrough is not coming yo I love it And it comes from the fact that at a lot of my talks in the Q&A session, the number one question I get is, what was your turning point? And to me, that question is based on a romanticized understanding of change. It's based on the assumption, maybe heavily influenced by Hollywood, <laughs> yeah. that we we all need this this one breakthrough moment. One shot, one opportunity to seize everything you have ever wanted. <laughs> yeah, when s- s- something just clicks. Yeah. As we go running under the rain with dramatic music <laughs> playing in in the background when i think about my journey it hasn't been about uh the breakthrough moment it's been about what i call millions of micro moments of bravery oh i love that man and those are not the moments that people see. When they see us performing at a big show that is that is going really well, what, what, what they don't see is, for example, to use my journey, they won't see me going to, to the mall and challenging myself to talk to a hundred complete strangers every single week, which I had done on a weekly basis for multiple years. And and they won't see those micro moments of bravery, but those are those are those iterations where the growth gradually happens so that we can then meet the meet the more defining moments that that is one of the things that i forgot to say in the introduction but i'm happy that i didn't cuz it would have been kind of a spoiler back in when we had our first show in kensington that open mic we did a bunch of shows together after and one one day you kind of told us that one of the ways that you prepare for these shows that you, you go to the Jose goes to the mall and talks to like a hundred strangers, just strikes up a conversation, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that kind of allows you to prepare for the potential risk of rejection on stage or to conquer the fear of rejection or conquer the fear of failure on stage. 
or you you even did that before you you had a successful speaking and comedy career mm. yeah so i was i was doing that ch- challenge over the p- past years even i had also began before i had learned about it on a speech th- therapy program i had done however when i s- started to do stage performances i could tell that this ch- challenge could really prepare me for those moments yeah in a way you you this you described the r- r- relevant fears eloquently it was all about desensitizing myself yeah to to these reactions because a big part of stuttering is not just the fact that you're getting s- stuck on words it's that when you get stuck on words you might get reactions from people that make you feel small yeah that that make you feel unworthy yeah and and really quite frankly that are very uncomfortable to deal with and i have found that the more i deliberately exposed myself to uncomfortable reactions the more i was able to change my relationship with that discomfort so that i no longer interpret fear or discomfort as an indication for inaction rather i started perceiving that same exact fear and discomfort as an invitation to action oh that's brilliant and, it, and that really changed how i interpreted and subsequently reacted to to a psychological and f- f- physiological experience that quite frankly has remained unchanged over the years that experience of fear has not changed that drastically over the years my relationship with it though has evolved oh that's so brilliant man and in many ways like you always say like uh everyone stutters i just do it when i speak and we we always unwillingly have a, a connection of if we're rejected or if we we fail uh, on quotations we kind of correlate that to our self-worth mm. but the more you desensitize yourself to that you're able to see that the reaction is just the reaction and you don't have to tell your you don't have to tell yourself a story about it it's just a reaction and and those are the facts and but it doesn't mean anything about you it's just the reaction that it got and you i, I mean i know it's tough because i sometimes get reactions about other things people get reactions about other things and it's hard to not take it for uh to heart i read a a, a, a study the other day that said that we internalize rejection or negative criticism immediately like in one second we feel it in our heart <laughs> but if I, if we get a positive compliment a lot of people are uncomfortable with it and they mm-hmm. deflect it i'm like jose that re- that suit that uh, jacket l- looks really good on you mm. and the average person will be like nah man i just got this for like 12 bucks i just put 
and people can't accept compliments. Or I guess you will re respond right away and say yours too, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you won't say, nobody <laughs> say like, thank you, man. I, I put a lot of effort into how I look. I love this jacket as well. It really means a lot. So the study said that it takes <laughs> negative it's, criticism. It's like I was imagining uh, <laughs> an Oscar uh, acceptance speech <laughs> every time you get a compliment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to thank my mother, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my father. My dad, the, yeah. the lady who helped me out at the at store. The <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the study says that it takes... 10 to 15 seconds of you to take it in, acknowledge it, thank the person, and really, like, sit with it to be able to internalize it and feel it for, 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 for months later. Mm. The, so the same as you would internalize a negative criticism mm. right away. So it's, it's crazy what these things can do to you. But you also have to acknowledge and take in the, the, the positive or, or the things that make you feel great so that you can take them with you. And, and that, in many ways, can, can help you feel grateful. Mm. That can maybe affect the self-worth in many ways, too, because sometimes we focus on the negative so much that, that it, it really messes with our minds. I know that you mentioned the media and Hollywood having a role into how people think about stuttering or into how people think about this eureka moment like the breakthrough moment can you talk a little bit about movies or hollywood celebrities where stuttering is present and how that has affected the way that we see stuttering mm. two two milestones in recent years, about stuttering in the media and in 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 pop culture. On the one hand, we have the movie The King's Speech, mm -hmm. which I think really, which I think really presented the intricacies of what it means to deal with a stutter e emotionally. Yeah. I had gone to watch that movie by myself because I knew that I was going, I knew I was going to, to get emotional. Yeah. And I, Uh, 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 as a king, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this was a an important moment, and then also the current president of the U.S., Joe <laughs> Biden, has a. S S stutter as well and I'm not really I it's not really a a point at all about the politics but when the US elections were happening I remember having seen a lot of comments on social media that were the, the, that we're talking about the fact that that he he is unable to to s s speak and and oftentimes it was misinterpreted as a lack of competence or a lack of confidence now I know that there there are other instances where maybe yeah. some of those factors were relevant, but I only focused on the fact that I received a few videos where 
To me, it was obvious that he was having a s s s stutter, but that speaking interruption or disfluency was being interpreted as being s something else. Wow. Yeah, no, you know, I saw you speaking about this and it really opened my eyes because I hadn't really thought of that. You you spoke on CNN or on CP24 about that? I spoke. That? It was a big, big on channel. On Now This. Now This, yeah. Huge, like so, so many views. And and um, apart from, as as we get to towards the end of, mm-hmm. of, of the episode, apart from you being an incredible speaker and writer and and performer... Because the way that you bring, man, the uh, inclusion paradox, I loved. It, I'm not going to say anything because I want you guys to watch it. We're going to include Jose's TEDx talks in the show notes. But the way that you wrap up the your experience and connect it universally to the listener is brilliant. And I just loved I was looking, listening to the inclusion paradox right before uh, – I was listening to it again right before the episode – the recording this and there was like a minute left and i'm like how is this guy t- gonna turn it around <laughs> like he's gotta finish it and in like two sentences you wrapped it up beautifully you even had like a bunch of seconds left and i'm like this guy is a master at his craft and, <laughs> i mean the and the reason why i'm saying it is especially because when you're in this business the hard part is being simple the hard part is talking in simple words so that everybody gets it. Mm. Like a lot of scientists and Nobel laureates and professors with a bunch of awards. Yeah, they're smart, but when they talk nobody can understand <laughs> cuz mm. they they can't they can't give their message for dummies, mm. you know? Mm. And in many ways the success of your message sometimes if you want to do it at scale relies on the majority of people understanding mm. it. So I love it. And the other thing that you do really well is that you're very good at posting and keeping everybody updated. So sometimes people may have the illusion that we do better than we actually do because when they see us post online like and you're you're on big stages, well, man, that Jose guy is fucking killing it and you are. But Behind that, I love a strategy that you shared with me. I, I always share it in my productivity machine workshop. It's the post and ghost strategy of Instagram. Can you share what it is and and why it it, it really resonated with you? Mm. I I first heard the post and and ghost line on the country. Controversial these days, Joe Rogan podcast, <laughs> which, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I heard him s- s- say that line once a couple of years ago, and I do actually limit my time on social media. I find that in terms of mental wellness, yeah, I. It's important to have a healthy relationship with really everything, yeah, including social media and and there are obviously a lot of benefits for being on social media, especially in our industry. So I find that I find that the healthiest use of the platforms for me has been to go in, to post, and then to ghost, and then to leave the platform, yeah. and and to maybe check in again one day later, to check in again after after twenty four hours to so good to not get sucked into how the post is doing in the moment. Do you delete the app or you just leave? I typically now, of course, I, w- when I say these 
when I talk about these practices, I do have my days when I succumb, but it's the the overall tra- trajectory yeah. of of that habit goes towards a a healthy relationship. So I will typically set myself a specific time frame to to go on social media. And then sometimes, yeah, I will delete it and and then re and then re-download it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the the key part of that is that there's nothing wrong with Instagram or social media. It's it's how you use it and it has to be a healthy relationship. Otherwise it'll dominate you and then you end up I always say that sometimes before I did like a very good cleanup of everything that I was following, Mm -hmm. I realized that I was coming into Instagram at like a probably eight out of 10 level of emotion and Mm. and positivity. And I always left less like Mm. a six or a five Mm. and being like, fuck, my life sucks. Everybody else has a mansion and a jet and and they're millionaires. (laughs) But, but, but why do I expose myself to this? I know that that's going to be what I'm looking at. Mm. So now I only follow like, I don't know, like 500 people, which I guess sounds like a lot, but it's not a lot in terms of Instagram. Mm. And and uh, I make a point in following people that make me feel good about myself mm. and inspire me that I want to interact with or that I learn from. Mm. And if there is a channel, an account that I really enjoy, for example, Bleacher Report, which has the best sports highlights, mm-hmm. then I can go in without feeling guilty intentionally Mm. when i go on instagram as opposed to going there spending 15 minutes and another 15 minutes at a channel that i don't even like Mm. people that i that make me feel bad about myself or or make me that trigger me you know Mm. so that post and goes has been instrumental for me in terms of being intentional and protecting my mental health because being unhappy is inefficient (laughs) <laughs> and a lot of people think of productivity as a as a function of time like oh more i want to do more in less time but really you're supposed to you should see it in terms of energy and willpower mm. and yeah time is obviously an important component but not all hours are created equally you could do something in 1 hour if you're like inspired and it could take you 45 hours if you're feeling shitty you know mm. so like uh, my friend Alejandro Hea says we all have these dementors like Harry Potter reference mm. that will just suck up your your emotion your mm. positivity and it's not about just losing the day like a, a dementor could fuck you up for a couple weeks you know mm. and then you what 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 did it yeah <laughs> could suck you up a couple weeks you didn't do anything and it, it just sucked up all your energy and your willpower and then it didn't help. So I'm all about protecting, protecting my mental health. Obviously, some days, some weeks, I have, I, I don't have the the best of weeks. But mm. it's not about the one week. It's the trajectory. Mm. It's the long term that we have to mm. think about. Mm. Dude, this has been incredible. We were uh, close to the final question that everybody gets. Mm-hmm. But before I want to ask you, I noticed and I saw the trailer to your documentary. Mm. You filmed in Toronto. You filmed in Montreal a little bit. You went, or you went to Lebanon to film as well. Mm. What's the status? Is is there a status? Mm. Because I saw the trailer and it was brilliant. Yeah. So there is a movie being made about this journey I've embarked on. It was not my idea to make the movie. <laughs> <laughs> which might have which might come across as being narcissistic like is anyone seeing this <laughs> there should be a film uh, about this yeah so i met the f- filmmaker Josiane Blanc early on in my journey in, in Toastmasters actually really and i was about to do my first ever inspirational speech. And 
that's when I was telling you that I had no idea what the speech should be about. And she was intrigued by the fact that some guy with a stutter was in public speaking to begin with Mm -hmm. and that I was about to compete Uh, as well a few months after that. So she wanted to only film a a short. But, But then as my journey unexpectedly evolved so did the scope of her movie in terms of the expected release i want to say sometime next year so we'll see love it when that is i guess we'll find out the updates we can follow the updates on jose's instagram yes way jose with a z with a z but it'll be on the show notes and the last question, my friend, if we were to meet a year from now mm. with a bottle of champagne, mm. 2023, what are we celebrating in Jose Piranian's life? Mm. I really like David's tea. So perhaps having a tea blend under my name... At David C, a tea blend c- called Yes Way Jose. <laughs> With avocado flavor. <laughs> <laughs> well, another thing that you don't know about Jose, he loves avocado, but even more than that, this freaking diner in Yorkville called Flo's Diner, it's amazing. Yeah. And Jose has single handedly financed. The survival of this diner <laughs> for like six years now. Me- and me and Eugene Levy, who loves to go there. Oh yeah, he goes there. I've I've seen him there at least three, four times. Really? He yeah he. I I think he's a big fan as well yeah. of you. That's why. He goes there. <laughs> <laughs> and the other, I I went there with you, I think, or. With uh, well, Yorkville, where the diner is, is where uh, like a lot of celebrities go to, especially during TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival. But when, when I think I was with you and with my friend Arturo, who loves that place as well, mm. with Iggy, we saw walking the um, Giovanni. What was it? The Italian guy who played for Toronto FC. Mm. Uh, Giovanni Mm-mm. oh my god I can't believe I'm missing the name <laughs> Italian guy for Toronto FC oh Sebastian Jovinko okay. we saw him walking around there when he played for TFC twice two different mm. times I was there Wow! and there's a lot of celebrities walking by including Jose Piranian <laughs> yeah I think I also saw a few months ago Stefan Dyer walking around there <laughs> I was too sh- shy about going up to him. This was not a micro moment of br- bravery for me. Next time, next time. It has to be a macro, a ginormous <laughs> macro moment, macro moment yeah. of bravery to ask me for a picture. <laughs> Just joking. Ask for it anytime. Ask for Jose's picture anytime. Add him on Instagram. Dude, this has been like instrumental. What a beautiful episode. We postponed this for like 10 times. And I'm happy we waited because now Jose has his his uh, bio continues to increase every time because he's conquering the world. One incredible speech at a time. Ladies and gentlemen, so happy, so proud. I deeply admire you. Jose Piranian and Stefan Dyer on the Stefan Dyer podcast. Ciao, ciao. Gracias por escuchar el Stefan Dyer Podcast. Arrivederci, my people.